thought of any, or, or just tell me, Brian, if you do anything. Um, okay. Cool. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I just learned that this is not amplification, just for the video. So if you guys can wave at me, if you can hear me, or if I need to speak up, just tell me. Um, hope everything is readable. Anyway, so um, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk with you about cacheability metadata today. Um, so um, before I do that, um, want to thank the sponsors. Without the sponsors, I would not be here. You would not be here. Um, so I think they're doing a great job uh, supporting us and, and allowing us to have a great week over here. Um, same goes for my employer, Trigbanta. They allow me to prepare pre uh, presentations like this one um, during work hours. So um, thanks to them as well. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about cacheability metadata. Um, before what what's the cursor doing there yeah that's better um can we see some hands i, I would like to know who has already built a production drupal 8 site over here i can see one two. oh wow okay oh that's pretty good okay so um by now you might know a bit about the drupal 8 caching system who of you has written like custom drupal 8 modules all right, okay. Um, so um, if you already did and maybe you didn't think about caching or maybe you uh, are going to um, anyway, uh, the information here is I think pretty important for every one of you to understand and know. There's place in front as well if you need it. Okay, so um, many of you might be familiar with this quote by Philip Carlton, he said, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Um, and well, he's pretty much right, naming things is hard, but we're not going to talk about that today. And cache invalidation is hard, and cache invalidation means knowing when something that is cached is not, actual, not, not uh, relevant anymore, it's too old. So what is the goal of caching? What do we actually need? Well, we want our content that is displaying on a website to be as current as possible. We want to have a high cache hit ratio, meaning that as often as possible, things are being served from the cache, meaning that it's um, actually doing its work. And we have a low cache invalidation complexity. And what that means is that it's easy to um, flush things from the cache and um, rebuild stuff when needed. Now the problem is, you have to choose two, because you cannot have all three. This is, it's, it's just an impossibility. Okay, so when development for Drupal 8 started, um, we said, okay, we choose this first one, and we choose the second one, and we choose to add complexity to the um, uh, invalidation logic. Um, so that's why I'm here today, because of this choice. Okay, so first let's have a look at what is caching actually and why do we care? No, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that would be completely boring. <laughs> yeah, no, I wanna talk with you about expectation management in pizzerias. Because my first job was baking pizzas um, back in the Netherlands. Not as good as the pizzas over here. Sorry, Italians, they were like these really thick American ones. Sorry, I mean, I was 16, don't blame me. Um, but anyway, the store looked a bit like this. You see you all these pictures over here, and you could actually see what you're going to order. Well, and that's really important because it helped us to explain what our customers were going to get. So, what if you want to do that? What if you want to show someone, here's what you're going to get? Well, the easiest way is just to bake and show that pizza, obviously. Because yeah, you, you make a pizza margarita and you say, okay, here, this is our pizza margarita. Do you want it or not? But it's not going to work. You better bake it once and take a picture. So that's what we did. There were all pictures of our pizzas and um, then people could see what they were about to order. Well, this essentially is what caching is all about. 
avoid repeating expensive operations. Just making that photograph, just baking the pizza only once and then making the photograph and using the photograph afterwards. That is caching. Okay, so how do we refer to those pizza pictures? Well, you can give them a name, it's easy. Well, okay, we talked about the naming things is hard as well, but we're not going to discuss that today. Um, it's easy. And this concept, having a name for each item that is be, ha has been cached, that's what we call cache keys in Drupal 8. Well, so in a pizzeria, you could call it a pizza alla verdura or um, something else. Um, if you're more into computer things, you might give it an ID instead of a name. You know, works a bit better. But anyway, we give it a name so we can retrieve it and refer to this object being cached. Okay, so far so good. But things change. They change all the time. And that's why we and you get paid to build CMSs, right? Because things change and customers want change. Um, so for instance, all of a sudden, the chef of the pizzeria decides that from now on we are not using green peppers anymore, we're only using red peppers. Which I can't blame him because, I mean, they just taste better. So, good choice, but what do we do? I mean, the pizza has changed, so if the pizza changed, we have to trash the picture. Well, that thing is cache invalidation. Trashing the picture because this picture is not relevant anymore. Okay, so that's one of these hard things. It might seem simple, just trash the picture, but yeah. That's one of the hard things that Phil Carlton was talking about. Because if you remember, we have to be as current as possible. Meaning, in this situation, the pictures must be up to date. And we want to have a high cache hit ratio, which means that all pizzas must be photographed at any moment. We always want to have photographs of any available pizza at every moment. Otherwise, we will not have a high cash his, uh, sorry, <laughs> cash hit ratio. And we want to have a low cash invalidation complexity. So in this example, that would mean it must be easy to trash pictures. And not all pictures, come on, I mean, trash the right pictures. So we don't want to trash all pictures every time something changes. I mean, come on. So. So how do we decide who is trashing which picture? So, um, I mean, back in the pizzeria where I, where I worked, we were high school kids. We were not accountants or we didn't want to keep an administration of all things. And so that is why complexity is being added to the cache invalidation system. So, hey, what if we write the ingredients of every pizza on the back of the picture. What would that mean? That would mean that once that this pizza alla verdura, which includes peppers, when it changes because somebody made a decision about the peppers, then one of the ingredients of the pizza is changed and we know, oh wait, this one needs a new picture and the pizza margarita does not. Okay, so in Drupal lingo, these things are called cache tags. Cache tags are basically the ingredients of what you're caching, what it is made of. So you know when the ingredients change, the thing that you made with it changes along with it. So cache tags. And now we can trash all, pe all pictures with peppers on them. And that's what's called invalidating a cache tag. So this is the complexity or one of the most important parts of complexity that has been added to Drupal 8 in order to allow you, being pizza bakers, to invalidate your pictures, to invalidate your caches. Once you know what the ingredients are, what the cache tags are, you can invalidate really specifically, okay, that one's old, that one's old, and these other three are still good. Okay, so, then come customers. And we, we all have customers, don't we? I mean, life would be so much easier if we didn't have customers, but um, that's a bit difficult in a pizzeria. But anyway, in comes this customer and he says, okay, I like this pizza alla verdura, but with olives. 
And again, I can't blame him because every pizza is better with olives. But anyway, the pizza has changed. So does that mean we are going to trash the picture? Who says yes? No, of course not. Because I mean, the pizza olive verdura is still that pizza. So what do we do? Let's pay, take an extra picture, just in case. Just in case someone else comes by again next week and says, I want this pizza with olives. And I say, okay, hey, we did it before. We can do it, but without trashing the original picture. Okay, so this is what cache context is all about in Drupal 8. Cache context is about having multiple variations of the same thing. So now we have two variations of the same pizza, one with and one without olives. And we can just cache them next to each other. We don't have to trash one because the other changed. Okay. So what is the big difference now between cache tags and cache context? Well, the cache tags were about ingredients, the things that you put into that pizza. The cache context is about external factors, people coming in. So on your website, that might be a cookie that your user has set or it might be um, the day of the week um, because on Sunday it should look different than on the other days. So that's external factor. Right, okay, so when it comes to cache invalidation, these are the important questions to ask. What are we caching? What is it made of? What are the ingredients? Which means when should you invalidate? Um, and is the cache really stale or is it just different? So if it's stale cache tags, if it's just different, then it, you're probably dealing with cache context. And how long does it keep? Um, so this is how Drupal 8 solves this problem. And this is how Drupal 8 answers these questions. What are we caching? That's what we call cache keys. What is it made of? Cache tags. Is it different? Well, then we're talking about cache context. And this last one, I didn't mention yet, how long does it keep? For that, we have cache max age. Often, we don't actually need max age. Max age is just the simple um, concept that we used to have in Drupal 7. So just keep this for five minutes or keep this for five hours and then do it again. Usually, you can have a more sophisticated way of invalidating your cache just because we have all these other mechanisms. But sometimes it's not possible. For instance, when you're dealing with an external API, you're pulling in data from some external source. You don't want to do that on every request. So what do you do? You just say, okay, let's assume that it changes something like once an hour and then once an hour you pull in the new data from the external API. So that's what cache max h is about. So the combination of these four things, the cache keys, the cache tags, cache context and cache max h, that is what we call cacheability metadata. Now why is cacheability metadata awesome? I'm really enthusiastic and it took me a while before I really understood what it was and then I dived into really understanding the different words, which is why I'm telling you now what I learned so far. Um, and I, I got really thrilled about all the possibilities that it turned out to have. Um, I really think that this is one of these parts where Drupal really shines. It is structured, meaningful data. It, in fact, it's data about your data and um, having it really precise, stored, defined um, is, is really something that you can build awesome things with. So let's look at some things that we can do now because this cacheability metadata is in core. We can have dynamic page cache. It's a core module. It's turned on by default. What does it mean? Well, it can cache the whole page except some highly dynamic parts. For instance, the uh, block that shows the contents of a, a shopping cart. 
that differs from user to user and it can uh, change quite quickly. Um, so yeah, that's not to be cached, but it doesn't mean that you cannot cache like the news page or a product page or something else. So instead of saying, okay, this whole page cannot be cached, no, let's just cache the whole page and, and have a placeholder in there. And then when the page is rendered, just retrieve everything from cache, accept this small placeholder part, render that and return the whole thing. It's great that we can do that because it makes sure that we cache what is cacheable and have dynamic what needs to be dynamic. And because of cacheability metadata, Drupal can automatically figure out which parts are highly dynamic and which parts are cacheable. Auto placeholdering, it is called. It Wow, blew my mind when I learned about that. Um, same goes for BigPipe. It's in core, it's an experimental module. Um, what BigPipe does, it takes it a step further. It says, okay, well, if we have this cached page with some highly dynamic parts, why wait until the highly dynamic parts have rendered? Let's start sending this piece of cache to the user immediately. So the user will start seeing like 90% probably of the content immediately, and then we will insert these highly dynamic parts afterwards. The effect of this is that the time from first request to the completion of the request does not change. It's, it's not faster overall, but the time between the first the, the initiation of the request and the moment that a dr the, the user sees the first text on the screen is dramatically faster. So that's a great thing. It feels much faster. And then there's refreshless. It's a contrib module. I s have listed it as alpha. I'm not sure if it's maybe even better already, but anyway, it takes this concept yet another step further. It says, okay, when clicking a link, now Drupal can actually, thanks to cacheability metadata, figure out which parts of this page are similar to the previous page. So you can just keep them in the browser and only refresh the things in your page that actually have changed. It's brilliant. Now, what is the most awesome, inspiring thing about all of these things? These three modules, they're all zero config. Just let that sink in. Zero config. You don't have to configure anything. You don't have to tell Drupal which parts are dynamic and which parts are cacheable. You don't have to tell Drupal anything. Well, as a site builder, you don't. <laughs> but yeah, um, these modules are zero config because the real hard work is being done in a stage before that. It's done when the cacheability metadata is being added. That's the important part, and if you get that right, this just works out of the box, bam. And that's great for performance. And let's mention that no other CMS I know of has this. Refreshes was inspired by um, something that is uh, known in the uh, Ruby community as Turbo Links, if I'm correct. And um, it kind of does the same thing, but you have to configure yourself which parts of the page are similar between links and which not. It's not zero config, this is. So anyway, there are a couple of things we must do now. And I really say must do now. This is important for developers, people writing their own modules. Well, I mean, you can just say, let's not cache at all. I will just build this page on every single request and uh, I'll be fine with that. And sometimes a page is relatively fast and, and okay, you can do that. But um, overall, you can assume that you must add cacheability metadata. If not, you might get worse performance. I mean, that's obvious, I guess. Caching is about performance, so no caching, worse performance. The second one is pretty obvious as well. Um, you get possible stale content. Sometimes that's acceptable, sometimes you really don't want it to happen, but what if you can like 
precisely control when caches are invalidated, then you have um, the, the minimum of stale content with the maximum of performance, which is a great combination. And the third is something to really consider, possible security problems. If you start caching things and you don't include the correct cacheability metadata, you might be looking at something that is called uh, information disclosure, I think. Is it information? Yeah. Always mix up the terms, but yeah. So anyway, information disclosure, meaning that, for instance, there is some information that is only meant for uh, logged in users and you're showing it to anonymous users. That's a problem and it's a security problem. Emails, for instance, yeah, or, or um, what they ordered in your web shop. I mean, all kinds of possibilities. So if you don't get the cacheability metadata right, this could be a problem. So um, think about that. So developers, <laughs> cacheability metadata is your problem now, especially if you write contributed modules, if you write other things that other people have to build upon, but um, even if it's just something custom within your own company and um, you future yourself will thank you for considering this now, add the cacheability metadata whenever you can because it is your obligation now to get this correct. So let's see this in action to see what this actually means that it's up to you now as developers. I'm using some render array examples because they're, I think, the most uh, uh, easy to understand. And, oh, that's dark. Can you see it in the back? Um, yeah, can we turn off the light over here? Better? Okay. Okay, so um, this is like an example. Um, this would be a callback function in a route controller. So um, when you call a page callback in Drupal 7. So there's a function. And here we are adding, this, this, this is the build, so this is the render array. We're just adding a simple string. And here I'm saying cache and I'm adding a key. I just can choose a key that is just my self-made up key and I'm calling it cache demo static because this is static content. Just, ashing, just, sorry, just adding the cache key means that it will be cached. Simple as that. Okay, so choose your own, but also, sorry, yeah. It will not be cached, correct, yeah. So um, just choose your own cache key, but choose wisely. Hey, we'll talked about naming things, right? Okay, so um, let's see cache tags in context. I have an example here where we use config. So um, this assumed that the config factory was injected with dependency injection, and now we have the config of the site system.site over here. And now we can use the site name to insert it into our string. So you can say, welcome at my awesome site. Okay, so once you're depending on something like your site config, that should trigger an alarm in your head now and say, okay, wait, I'm depending on something. This is an ingredient of my render array. So if this is an ingredient, I need to tell Drupal about it. So that's how we, what we do here. Um, on the render surface, there's a method called add cacheable dependency. And we are adding a dependency on config to the build. What this does, not much more than just adding one more item to the array here, but it's just cleaner and uh, more future-proof to um, use the method over here to add this information to our own uh, render array. Um, a good question. Um, it I think the uh, the object has to implement a certain interface, um, but I'm not sure exactly which one. Sorry, I have to. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot like uh, 
and well, this is like simple config, but config entities, entities. Um, uh, I think those are like among the, the most important that you would want to depend on. Um, but there, yeah, there are there are more things. As long as they can, um, uh, as 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 their objects that know their own cache tag and then provide their own cache tag, then um, this cache tag can be added to your um, uh, render array in the cache part over here. Oh wait, no, well, <laughs> there we have it. I <laughs> didn't remember I put it in. Um, the cacheable dependency interface, there's your answer right there. That's why this works. Okay, cache contacts now. Um, so here I am using the uh, uh, the path, a, a parameter from the path, and um, passing that parameter to the callback. And this means that if I go to hello slash mark, this should say, hello world, you must be mark. Okay, so that's a dependency, well not really dependency, but it, using something from an external source. Yeah, it's not something we control, it's something that comes from outside. And this means that my instance might be cached, and your instance might be cached, and your instance might be cached, and they can all live next to each other. Mine is not invalid once somebody else visits the site. So that's why we call this cache context. Contexts are defined in Drupal core. There's a number of contexts, like uh, the URL path, like cookies, like um, uh, if the user is logged in or not. No, no, that's, yeah, I think that's in there as well. Anyway, and there's a couple of, of predefined contexts in Drupal core. Um, oh, well, yeah, the, the theme is one of those things as well, because uh, sometimes you can have a different theme on a certain page. So anyway, these are defined in core. If you need more contexts, their plugins, uh, you can write your own cache contexts and, and make them available to the system as well. So anyway, this will tell Drupal that um, this thing varies by the URL path, and so it knows how to store multiple instances. Something interesting is happening here because if you would make something that depends, for instance, on the user or the user session, then that triggers um, like an alarm for Drupal itself because Drupal knows, okay, wait, this cache context user, there may be so many users, it's not even useful anymore to actually cache this because, well, think about Drupal org, it has like a million users and you don't want a million cache entries for a certain object on your page. So this is where this auto placeholdering hooks in, which I talked about earlier. Some cache contexts are configured to be uncacheable. And then auto placeholdering kicks in and Drupal will say, okay, I'm just going to uh, put a placeholder in the cache and we will render this dynamically. But also there, if it needs tweaking, you can do it. Okay, now finally, let's see how cache max age works. Um, so here I have, hello world, the current status is status, and then that status we get from an external API. We don't know how it works. We don't want to know how it works. It just returns something and we use it. So what do we do? We put a figure on here, uh, uh, it's an integer. Uh, in seconds, so we are now caching this for one hour, and after one hour, it will be invalidated and it will be built again. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, usually, you want something more sophisticated, but sometimes something more sophisticated just is not there. So that's when we use this. So, developers, this is why cacheability metadata. It's not just your problem, but it's your opportunity as well. Um, that was a bit quick. Um, so, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, there's a lot to gain here. Uh, performance, um, a great user experience because of the, the performance, the, the quick delivery of pages. Um, so yeah, I think if we all start using cacheability metadata the way it's meant, um, 
then there is like a, a really bright future for Drupal performance and uh, Drupal usability ahead of us. So um, I want to say thanks, to, well, to to you, the community, everyone who made this possible. Um, special thanks to Wim Leers and Fabian Franz. Um, who have been working very hard on this. Um, they did an awesome job uh, getting this into core, uh, making sure that all modules actually provide their cacheability metadata. Wim Leers has written the big pipe module and the refreshes module afterwards. So um, let's just send them a tweet right now or do it this afternoon um, to say thanks. And, and I really want that the whole Drupal Dev Days lets them know that they did an awesome job getting this into core. So I'm going to do that now, so take your phones. <laughs> There. All right. So um, I'd love to know: Are there any questions, remarks, stuff? <laughs> Go ahead. So let's say you add a piece of uh, render, right? Not a bigger render version. Yeah. Example: You add an extra field on the node, and that extra field is a live widget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is not cacheable in a way. Yeah. But the whole render array gets cached. Yeah. So if you put cache context there or cache tags, you bubble up. Yeah. The whole render array doesn't cache anymore. Exactly, yes. If you don't do it, then you have issues that like widgets from some users get shown to other users. Exactly, yeah. So uh, well, the solution there, uh, sorry, I repeat the question. Um, when you have a larger render array that incorporates uh, some other render array, the larger one may be cacheable, but if the smaller one is not, then the whole thing is not cacheable. Because, uh, for instance, you, you see that when a page contains some user data, um, you don't want to show the user data of one user to another user. So that's what uh, cache bubbling does. Um, it's a bit complex like, to, to completely show how it works in code, but um, uh, remember this, this term, cache bubbling. Um, so what it does, it allows uh, Drupal to see that certain parts lower down in the render array um, are not cacheable. And then it will bubble up and uh, Drupal will draw conclusions about the entire object based on the parts that are inside there. So as long as you add your cacheability metadata to everything you send out from your own modules, other code that reuses your render arrays must be able to um, uh, do it correctly, basically. Drupal should just pick it up. Well, it can be placeholders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, if if well, I mean, the page is is just one of these examples. If the page can be cached, but just one part cannot, then uh, an auto placeholdering will put a placeholder in the place where this single piece is, and then um, do that dynamically and cache the rest of it.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so let me summarize for the back of the room. Um, so, Joao is telling us that um, if uh, the, on, on one of his sites there is a, a page that accepts uh, query parameters, and Google is trying to index that page with many, many, many different query parameters. Yeah. Oh, it just passes them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so they it doesn't even change the page, but um, it does lead to uh, a lot of uh, cached render arrays in uh, in the database. So that's why they clear cache every two hours, I guess, and um, just to make sure that the the cache does not fill up. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, I haven't seen the problem, so I'm, I'm I'm just thinking out loud here. But I think you might be able to um, solve that um, by uh, configuring which uh, cache contexts are considered uh, not cacheable. Um, so if if you can like tell Drupal, okay, so f there can be so many different um, uh, query parameters that it's not feasible to add a new variation for each single one of them, just like Drupal does with users, then it would stop doing that. Um, I think that should work, but... Um, exactly. Um, so you would not cache any variations based on the path. It cannot vary by path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes you need them and something. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, probably. Or maybe it's configurable per page. So so I, I don't know the exact answer to your question, sorry. But I, th I think you should look in that direction to uh, to solve it. And meanwhile, well, like you say, just clearing it every two hours is, is a workaround for now, I understand. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, yeah, there is some things that Drupal does automatically, like um, uh, when you choose a cache key, that's, I hope I'm saying this correctly, and when you choose a cache key, it will add a hash of uh, roles, and um, uh, I think the user language is, is in there as well. Um, there are some things that like are automatic contexts that you don't even see happening, you don't have to add them, but um, that's stuff that Drupal automatically does just to um, make stuff a little easier for you because things may always vary by role or vary by language. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. No, they're um, not meant to be replaced by this. They are uh, built on each other. Um, when you uh, talk about memcache, for instance, there are still things that need to be retrieved from cache. And memcache is just a faster storage. Um, so instead of uh, storing it in a database, just storing it in memory, it's just faster. So um, in some cases, it still makes sense to use memcache just because the cached stuff is faster to retrieve. 
Um, similarly, um, you can still use stuff like varnish uh, or CDNs or, or other things that enhance performance. And in fact, this whole system um, really plays nicely together with uh, varnish and, and CDNs because this cache tag idea is also built into um, some CDNs. I mean, those uh, uh, layers in front of your site also need to know when something is not valid anymore or when something changed. So, um, actually, the, the data model of uh, cacheability metadata in Drupal is pretty similar to what happens in those kinds of systems. So, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just a better match, it does not replace it. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the question is, is there something like cache min age, just like there is cache max age, to prevent something from being rebuilt too often? Um, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it anywhere. And um, no, I'm. I don't know if if there is something. Um, so uh, if anyone in the audience happens to have seen it, I see people shaking heads. No. Yeah, that that would be possible. You could do things with varnish, and I think um, uh, probably the, the the caching system is is expandable. And and uh, I'm assuming that you could write something yourself that adds this uh, uh, well, that adds this uh, uh, to your system. Oh wow. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, no. Uh, for them, uh, at the moment, I don't think there is something like that. Any more questions? Okay. So then, um, I thank you all. Thank you for attending, and um, like to uh, see you uh, maybe tonight at the informal social walk, drink event, or somewhere else in the hallway. Thank you. <laughs>